name is Patrick Gentile, and welcome to the first in a series of 30 lectures of our proven SAT workshop program called SAT Gladiator. I will be your commentator as we embark upon a marvelous journey to decode, decipher, and unlock the secrets to the English language by using Latin and Greek tools. In each podcast, our instructor is going to show you how, by mastering these components, you will become armed and dangerous for the critical reading section of the SAT. At the end of this lecture series, it is my expectation that you will have the confidence and stress-free tools necessary to become one of our many certified SAT gladiators. Our approach to each podcast will be simple and straightforward. Each podcast will be self-contained and independent of one another so that you can work on these lectures at your own pace and schedule. Each podcast will include an introduction on the planned lesson, then an in-depth review of prefixes, which will be followed by an in-depth lecture on suffixes. Our instructor will then delve into three Latin roots and show you the exponential power of each of these roots, and how, when combined with prefixes and suffixes, you will be able to easily understand the meaning of English words. To reinforce each root, our instructor will then go over in detail an SAT sample type question. At the end of the podcast, there will be a brief time practice quiz of additional SAT type reading questions and a reading passage to help ensure that you've mastered the material of the podcast. You can always go back to the tutorial to help you if you find that there is a prefix, root, or suffix that you're not sure about. And so, without further ado, I am proud to introduce to you our master class of instructor, Ms. Shannon Walker. Shannon, we're now in your capable hands. That'd be great. Um, I know it's a holiday, so we're going to go through this. We're just going to go through as much as we can, and we'll see if we can't make sure we finish on time today. So we're going to start out. I just want to say again what an impressive job you guys did last uh, last time, those questions were really tricky and I was really impressed with um, how you guys, you guys did. Let's take a look at the roots and the derivatives that we saw last time. Here they were. There were a bunch of them. Um, so let's take a look. Animus, mind, or intellect, the soul, uh, mere core to buy or to trade, having to do with uh, buying and selling, uh, four faucets to say, Jungo or Jungo, remember the I turns into a J often in uh, English, would be join or joint. Uh, salio, we saw salient was a derivative last time. And then, of course, quolo cultus, to, to live in a place or to till it, to work the land there. So we're going to do the same warm-up activity that we did last time. But this time, instead of doing one sentence, since we had so many words, Let's do two sentences using different derivatives and send them to me in chat. There are the words. I'll give you guys a minute. Both ants living together in the same place. They're very good. Um, ah, nice. I like Emma. Um, gentlemen, cultivate astute manners. Um, so cultivate in order to... Uh, grow or to nurture. So that was a great example. Um, I like uh, Nick's first sentence that had two. He was being uh, extra tricky today. Two derivatives. The cactus is very resilient. It jumps back. It bounces back uh, and can be cultivated in some of the harshest environments. It can be nurtured even when there isn't a lot of water. Great examples, you guys. Show me that you do know these words, so good job. Um, all right, let's take a look. Today we're going to be looking at a few roots. Let me put them up on the screen and see if you guys can get a guess of the meaning or if you guys can come up with a derivative. Um, oops, there we go. Um, this first one is an interesting Latin verb, gnosco or gnotus. Now, in English, usually that G sound um, would drop out because English doesn't do that gna sound very well, but Latin does it a lot. So think nosco and notice, even though it's spelled gnosco and gnotus. Um, baculum, caput capitis, libra, 
and Woko Wokatis. I'm going to let you guys think about it for a second as to what you think it is, and then I'll let you guys tell me either what you think the meaning is or you guys can uh, shout out some derivatives. I'll give you a few seconds to look at them. Oh, Emma, that's, a, that's actually a really great guess. Good job. Um, oh, good, Nick. That's a good derivative. Good. Oh, great, great guess, Morgan. However, um, captive, she says captain. Uh, Morgan guessed captive. Captive actually comes from another Latin word that's spelled very similarly, but that's a good guess. Just as um, Emma had said that she thought Libra meant book. You thought that because of library, probably. And that's also an excellent guess. It also comes from a Latin word that is spelled very similarly to Libra, but that's not what it means. Um, we did have some good guesses. We have uh, vocalization um, from Nick, from uh, WOCO. Okay, excellent. All right, let's take a look at the meaning um, of the word. Is Libra also a star sign or whatever? Yes, it is. And I was wondering if somebody was going to come up with that. It is. Libra is a sign of the zodiac, um, which is named after a constellation in the sky, uh, Libra. Do you know what the symbol for Libra is in the zodiac or the constellation? I'm not really into astrology, so I don't know. Libra? Yeah. Um, no, I don't. Uh, that's a good guess. Um, let me show you guys. Um, Gnosko, Gnotis means to know or to learn something. Um, that's a great guess. Baculum. Oh, yeah. Baculum means a stick or a rod. Kaput means your noggin. Okay. Kaput, Kapitus. Libra is a pair of scales. And so the constellation Libra, according to the ancients, looks like a pair of scales. Imagine the... The ones where you put a weight on one side and you put something else and then the scales have to balance, that's what it means by it, like a pair of scales because it has two plates and you have to get them to balance. And then woko means to call. Okay. Um, and, uh, Anne, I called her Anne. Emma had a great suggestion that um, for when we're guessing our derivatives and so forth, instead of sending it just to me, send it to everybody. So that'd be great. Now, when we're doing our answers to the questions, that you're still going to send that to me privately, so we're not giving away the answers to everybody else. But next time I ask you for a derivative, go ahead and type it out for everybody. Now that you see what the words mean, do you have some additional derivatives? Go ahead and type them in chat, but type them to everyone. Think of any. If not, I'll help you out. Decapitate. Love that word. What does it mean to decapitate someone, Nick? To take their head off. Yeah, to take their head off. Very good. Anybody else? I have some great derivatives. Oh. Invocate. What does it mean to invoke something? Um, it means to like call it off, I guess. Yeah, to call, like, I'm going to invoke Rule 27. I'm going to call on that. Yeah, very good. To call power from. Excellent, Emma. Perfect. Awesome. So let's take a look at some derivatives, and then we'll see if we can't figure out what they mean and see if we can maybe use, come up with some sentences using them. Um, Gnosko, diagnosis. Oh. Diagnosis. It, it, comes from, it comes from the word... Uh, Nosco, which means to know, and a Greek preposition. This is actually uh, also related to a Greek word. It also comes from a Greek preposition, and once again, I don't want yellow. I want purple because that's my favorite color. Um, it comes from the Greek preposition dia, which means uh, through, like going all the way through something. So, Morgan, if someone, if your doctor examines you and makes a diagnosis, that is because he thinks he knows what. No, Morgan, 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 Morgan. Morgan. Uh, he thinks he knows what you have. Yeah. He knows you through and through. He's examined you enough thoroughly to kind of know what's going on all the way through your body, and he makes the diagnosis. Um, 
Emma, what do you what does cognizant mean? Do you think? By the way, Anne is Emma today. I'm not sure if Morgan and Nick heard that. Cognizant. Soberly thinking. Yeah, very good. It's like to be thinking about something, to be aware of it, to know it, to have knowledge of it, right? It's to be aware of it. Um, Nick, what does it mean to be incognito? To not be known. Very good. Remember, in. How many, I'm going to say probably this. So many times you're going to be so sick of it. In as a prefix can mean in or in to, but it also means not, not known, right? If you're incognito, you're in disguise so that you're not, people don't recognize who you are. And then let's go back to Morgan, cognitive. So when they do tests to elementary children to test their cognitive development, what are they testing? Um, it means like... Look back at the meaning of the word. It's testing how well they how well they know something. How well they know things and how well they're learning. So because as the child's brain grows, their ability to learn changes. Um, you know, little kids can't do algebra. <laughs> their brains aren't ready for it yet. Um, but as their brains grow, their ability to learn and do more complex tasks change. So it's cognitive means having to do with your thinking or your mind. Excellent. Um, Baculum doesn't have a lot of derivatives in it, but it does have a couple. Bacillus um, is a derivative. I actually picked this one because I thought you might, might have seen this term in your biology classes. Um, you, did you guys know, see bacillus? Have you examined bacilli under a microscope? They are bacteria shaped like this. Okay, that's just a picture I got oh, off of Google. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so why then, um, Nick, would this be named Bacillus bacteria? Why would it have that name? Because they look like sticks. Yeah, they look like rods or sticks. Yeah, they're shaped like rods. Um, and that's why it's called that. Another derivative is debacle. Debacle. Um, have you ever heard somebody say, boy, they were really, uh, their presentation was really disorganized and they took a beating when they gave it? What do you what do you think uh, that means, uh, Nick? What do you think it means if you say that their presentation was a debacle? It was kind of, it kind of means it was a shamble. Yeah, it was it was a disaster. It's like they took a beating mm -hmm. on it. it. It didn't go well. Um, imagine them getting hit with sticks while they're doing the presentation because it was so disorganized. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's like take, taking a beating, as we say down south. Excellent. Oh my gosh, We get to decapitate. I'm so excited for for this this moment. I always wait for this every class when we talk about decapitate, because then I get to talk about Mike the Wonder Chicken. Are you aware of Mike the Wonder Chicken? You never heard? No. Oh my gosh. You will never forget decapitate and you will never forget Mike the Wonder Chicken for the rest of your lives. This is a chicken, true story, not making this up, that um, his owner decided to cook him for his mother-in-law. And so he went to cut off the chicken's head. And he knew his mother-in-law really liked the neck of the chicken. That was one of her favorite parts. So he really stretched that neck out and was trying to cut the head off as close to the head to leave as much neck for his mother-in-law. And he chops the chicken's head off. And how long do you think, I would like everybody to type in to everyone, a guess as to how long the chicken lived with no head. Because we all know a chicken, when you chop their head off, they run around. Then they remember they're dead and they lie down decently. How long do you think the chicken lived with no head? Type it in. A minute. Three days. Morgan, I'm going to give you a hint. It's more than that. So you're going to get the, probably the closest guess. <laughs> Anne says five minutes. It's more than that. Was it more than three days? It was more than three days. It was more than two days. Mike the Wonder Chicken days? lived with no head, I'm not kidding you, for 18 months. What? <laughs> True story. The, the brain stem that controls your autonomic functions like breathing and digestion um, 
was still attached to the spinal column because he chopped it so high up on the neck, the brain stem that controls those functions was still attached. And so it still controlled his digestion and his breathing. Um, the chicken just ran around and eventually he took pity on it. So he started feeding. Okay. Anne goes, ooh, you're really going to go ooh with this. So cover your ears. Is that he took pity on it because it had no head and it couldn't eat. So he would feed it with a dropper down its like gaping open neck hole. And he said, and finally he took it to the local university to try to figure out why it was still alive, and they examined it and figured it out. And he didn't die from a lack of a head. What happened is that there was some, he like choked on some mucus or something that got stuck in his throat and he suffocated. He didn't die because he didn't have a head. So anyway, you'll never forget decapitate because normally decapitation would ruin your day. But Mike the Wonder Chicken, he just shook it off and kept going. You know, he never looked back. Don't let anything get in your way. So Not even the, decapitation. What about the infection or, like, the blood loss? I, I thought about the blood loss, too. But, no, it's a true story. There are pictures of him. Go Google Mike the one, the Miracle Chicken or Mike the Wonder Chicken. There's, like, a Mike the Wonder Chicken festival. Anyway, you'll never uh, forget decapitation. <laughs> you'll never forget. You'll never forget. Um, uh, so, uh, Morgan, what is the capital of a state or a country? What, how is that related to Kappa? Um, it's like, like a bad, a like, you know, Albany day, is like, the capital in New York. So capital? what happened? Yeah, the capital. Oh, it means like the uh, head of the head of it. Like, it's yeah, like, the head, the so place like, that controls it, because your head controls the rest of your body. The capital of a, a country or a state is in control of that. Very good. Um, you can also think, uh. Never mind. Um, and then this last word, caprice, oh, the adjective. Nasty. I know. I took a second and looked at a picture of it. Oh, that was just nasty. Don't Google during class. Save it for later. Um, I told you, true story. Um, caprice is a noun. The, the, the adjectival form is capricious. If someone is capricious, that means that they're always just doing whatever they think of. That they, they will make spur decisions or snap decisions and just go and do it. It's like, oh. I just decided I was going to go bowling. Beep, I'm going to go. Um, so that's what it means. And it does come from copy. It's like, kind of like you're um, just doing whatever comes into your head. You have no control over it. It also is related really funnily to the uh, Latin word for hedgehog. Because I guess what it's saying is that your hair, like imagine somebody's going this way to go do something, and then they suddenly change their mind, and they have a different idea. Get the idea of their hair standing up while they turn around and go do something else. So it's kind of, it's, it basically capricious means hedgehog head. I don't know why that is, but it does. Um, <laughs> Libra is a set of scales. We already talked about the constellation Libra, which the symbol is a pair of scales. Um, so then, uh, uh, Emma, what does it mean if you do something deliberately, if, if an act is deliberate? Yeah, you did it on purpose. You weighed out all of the consequences of it, and you chose to do it um, as opposed to you didn't really think about it, you didn't weigh out the consequences, and it was you just acted on impulse or an accident. Um, Morgan, what does it then mean if, if you have equilibrium? Equilibrium. Like, like the middle or equal? Yeah, they're balanced. They're, the scales are in balance, right? There's no one thing that's overpowering something else. Just like we have the separation of powers in our country with the executive branch, the judicial branch, and the legislative branch, they're all in equilibrium with their power. So no one group is able to overpower the other two, right? Good. Um, um, and then, yeah, go ahead. At, our, our, at our school, um, there's a motto or something that says, very, very tough book, Libra B. Does the last part come from Libra? Uh, say it I, can you, I can't hear you. Can you say it one sure, more time? I can, I can type it. Oh, yeah, type it in. I'd love to hear it. I happen to love slogans. I think they're great. And most, they're, they're always better when they're in Latin because they sound better. Ah, what do you think that means? I'm pretty sure that means the truth will set you free. It does. It means the truth will set you free. Okay, now this is a great point. Thank you so much, Nick, for bringing this up. Because we have the word 
Libra, which means a set of scales. We have another word that looks very similar, uh, liber, the, another spelling would be libri, and that is what Emma was talking about earlier with that's the word for book. But you see how they're spelled similarly, that L-I-B-R? So you can see how that can be confusing. And then you have another verb, libero, which means to set free, okay? And that's the, the verb that you're looking at, to uh, set free. You think to, liberty would come from one of the other ones. It, liber, to liberate. The word for uh, liberty is liberta. That means freedom or liberty. So the problem with Latin is sometimes, as with English, as with any language, there are words that are spelled similarly that don't really have anything to do with one another. And so I can see how you look at Libra and you thought, oh, it looks like liberate, but it, it, it isn't. Um, it's just a, a similarly spelled word. But that's a great point. Uh, anybody else have a question? That was a great one. Nope, nope, nope. All right. And WOCO, this is a word actually that's really common. It's got a lot of derivatives and related words to it, um, like vocal. Uh, didn't somebody earlier say vocabulary? Those are great. Um, what then, I would say teaching is my vocation, okay? I've had other jobs, okay, other jobs, but this is my vocation. If, look, meaning that WOCO means call, what do you think vocation means, Emma? Anne, you're the one paying attention. Oh, Anne, I'm sorry, I'll stop. Calling on Emma and call on Anne. Anne, what do you think a vocation is, your vocation? I think of vocal and voice, that kind of thing. That's a, good, that's a good guess. Let's see if Nick has an idea. And then we'll see what Morgan thinks. I say teaching is my vocation. I've had other jobs. They weren't a vocation. It, they're your true calling. Thank you. It's my calling, right? Your vocation is what you're called to do. You feel inside it calling your name, right? Excellent. Um, evoke. Uh, we watched the movie, and it evoked feelings of family and togetherness. So what do you think it means, Morgan, to say evoke? It evoked feelings of family and togetherness. I, like, brought upon the feeling. Yeah. It called it – it actually comes from – uh, woco, which means to call, and ex, which means out of, not pit, out of. Um, and sometimes the X becomes just an E. The X would drop out because ex voke would be hard to say, right? So that's why the X disappears. But it means to call out or to call up feelings, right? To call up ideas, to evoke. Um, woo, this is a good one. Provoke. Don't provoke an argument with someone who's two times your size. What does it mean to provoke? To instigate. Anybody holler out or type it out? To instigate. Yes. But what does it mean to instigate? Emma? To start a fight. Yeah, to start something, right? Yeah. To, start, to like call somebody out on something and get in their face about it. To provoke. Um, <laughs> Yeah, to call out somebody. It's like, what do you think you're doing? Blah, blah, blah. Provoke it. And usually it implies feelings, uh, negative feelings. It's usually a negative connotation word, whereas evoke doesn't have a negative connotation. It has a neutral connotation. You can evoke positive feelings. You can evoke negative feelings. But usually when you're provoking someone, that's only negative, right? You don't provoke somebody to, to do good deeds. Um, and then the adjectival form of that is provocative, provocative. So then what would provocative mean, Morgan? It's like doing something annoying or like, like bad. Exactly. It's an adjectival form to describe someone's behavior. So you might say um, when the bully was being provocative when he was calling his victim names, um, it's, it's in order to lead someone into action. And usually that action is related to anger or to some type of passion, okay? Um, it, those are the kinds of emotions 
that are generated when you're being provocative, either anger or passion, okay? Excellent. Good job. Um, let's take a quick look at the first sentence, and then we'll take our quick break, okay? Uh, that is not a sentence. That is, there's our best to lie. Um, <laughs> let's go to the sentence. Okay. No questions about Mike the Wonder Chicken, sadly. Um, take a look and find the word that best fits the meaning of the sentence as a whole. Now, this is when you're going to send your answer to me privately so you're not shouting it out to everybody and giving them the answer. No. Give you guys a minute to read it. <clears throat> so we're just supposed to choose the letter? Is that the idea? Um, yeah. Pick, pick, well, as, oh, I'm sorry. You're right. I, I should have explained like I did last time. If you figured out the answer using the derivative, send me the answer that you think is correct. If you can't figure it out, then look at one of the other answer choices that you know you can eliminate and tell me why you eliminated that. Because eliminating wrong answers is also really important. Okay. That helps. Thanks. Thanks. Sorry. I forgot you weren't here last time. Do you know the answer? I'm really not. No. Do you know the answer? Good, Nick. <laughs> Read the question. I don't know. I know the answer. That's great. Type it in. Type it in. Type it in. <laughs> I'll go just type in that letter. What do you think? Oh. Well, first one. You can just type in the letter there. Okay. Am I wrong? I haven't <laughs> seen the answer. How can I tell you if you're wrong if I don't see the answer? I'm asking Emma what she oh, thinks. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Very. You guys are killing me tonight. Woo! We must be on vacation. All right. The All right. editor denied any knowledge of the reporter's alleged unethical interview techniques, claiming he had been blank of her finished work, but not of her journalistic practices. I think when I look at this, there's one word in here that is a key word that gives away the answer to the question. What do you think is the key or most important word in here that gives you a clue to the answer? Holler it out, any old body. But? But is all. Yes, you should always pay attention to any kind of connective words because they tell you what type of answer you're expecting. You're expecting an opposite answer. You're expecting a similar answer. That's good. So he's saying he knew her work, but he didn't know that she used unethical business techniques, right? So he's denying the not denying what? Knowledge. Knowledge. So we know that NOSCO means to know something, right? So to be cognizant of something is to have knowledge or to be aware. So he's saying, I knew about her articles, I read them, but I didn't know that she was being unethical when she interviewed the people. So he was saying that his knowledge was limited to the finished project pro product, not how she did it. Um, let's take a look at some of these other answers just to make sure that we understand why they're wrong. We have time to do that today because we don't have so many questions. Um, what does it mean? Let's look at B. Uh, what does it mean to be wary of something? Wary of something. Because we already said to be cognizant is the answer. Why is be, to be wary of wrong? Anybody? Yeah, it's unsure, untrusting. Yeah. Um, to be wary is to not trust something. Yeah, absolutely. I love that you said untrust. Cautious, Nick, is a great word. So um, he wasn't cautious of her finished product. There's no indication in the rest of the sentence that he had any concern about it, right? So we know that can't be it. He had been acknowledged, this is the key word, by. If you are acknowledged by something, that means someone is talking about you, right? If the articles are talking about him, does that have anything to do with his knowledge of the articles? No. What does it mean to be bemused? Like you have chagrin. You're kind of. Chagrin is a fancy word. 
Uh, go ahead. It, it means to what? Be silly? No, you like what? It like tickles your fancy. Oh. To do what? You said like tickles your fancy. Um, that's a that's a good guess. It's similar. It's similar. I know what we need to do. We need to go. If we're not a hundred percent sure, we need to go to everybody. Dictionary.com. Uh, Dictionary.com. So. Is this kind of like to be surprised? Take a look. Be amused. Um, it means to be bewildered or confused about something. To be, or it can mean that you're like thinking, you have so many things in your head that you can't focus, right? There are so many conflicting ideas going around that it keeps you lost in thought. Nick, is that your am I making the noise again? Can you meet for a sec and see? Thanks, Tom. So he wasn't confused by the articles. Um that doesn't hit or even if he was, it didn't have anything to do with whether he knew she was being unethical. So that's a good that's a good guess. But always go to dictionary dot com if you're not sure. I'm I'm sad it's not showing us the um etymology. Usually it does. Oh it looks it says it comes from muse. Okay. All right, let's go back. Stop sharing. Okay. Perfect. And what does it mean to be vindicated by something? Vindicated. To be redeemed by. Yes, to be redeemed by. To have some to be proven right. You know what I'm saying? It's like you're 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 supported by the evidence, you're vindicated. Once again, that has nothing to do with his knowledge of her unethical journalistic techniques. So we know that those are the wrong answers we can scratch them all off and we go right back to A. Perfect job. Good work. Um, all right. How about, it's, it's about that time for our quick break. So we'll do five minutes. My clock says um, it's about to turn 8.09. So we'll be back at 8.14. Okay? 8.14. See you guys in a minute. I have to unmute my microphone before I share my desktop and show everyone the official website of Mike the Wonder Chicken. Anne might not want to look because there's a picture of a headless chicken on the screen. How cute is that? Hello, Megan. This cutest thing I've ever seen. This is adorable. Isn't he adorable? And he would tuck his non-existent head under his wing and go to sleep, like. And he oh. would walk <laughs> and he would walk out and pretend to peck even though he didn't have a head to peck with. I guess the instincts are so cute. Yeah. Anyway. It's a little bit kind of, uh, I know, it's an amazing story. Kind of we could do onto something. This is he is my hero, this this chicken. Because he didn't let a little thing like decapitation slow him down. So I'm enjoying his life, you know? Just never give up. As as a wise, wise, wise woman once said, just keep swimming. You know? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, is everybody back so they can see Mike the Headless Chicken? This is important. That is amazing. <laughs> I know. I love this thing. And when I would tell this story at my last school, I would get calls from parents going, no, really, how long did the chicken live with no head? I'm like, no, I really haven't. All right, it's time for us to go back. Um, but I'm so glad you got to see my my hero, Mike, the Wonder Chicken. Um, go read his story later. It's really a great story. Um, all right, you guys are awesome today. Let's take a look at the next sentence, which I'm certain you are going to tell. Let's take a look at it. The pl oh, once again, my favorite, the double word. The play, which features blank mix of comedy, pathos, and music, was correctly described by one honest critic as a blank. So I'll give you guys a minute to look at them. Um, like I said, if you think you know the answer, send it to me. If not, think of, look at least one you can eliminate and tell me why it's not that answer. Send it to me privately in chat. I'll give you guys a minute. Thanks, Nick.
And you are nothing but trouble. Okay, good. Let's take a look. <laughs> let's take a look at it. And once again, let's try to see what type of word we're going to want to be plugging into each blank. So we have an idea. Are we looking for a positive word, a negative word? Let's take a look. So um, does anybody have a clue as to whether we're looking for a positive word or a negative word? Or are there any clues in the sentence that tell you that? I think that both blanks are going to be the same, either both positive or both negative. Why do you think that? That's a great observation. Why? Because the critic was correct in his description. So whatever the definition of the mixture is should be on par with his criticism. Thank you. That was exactly the key word I was hoping you were going to notice is that it is a correct assessment. So whatever it was, he called it that, okay? So we're looking for two similar words. So let's, what you normally what I would have you guys do is plug one word in and see if it fits. And then if it doesn't scratch it off, because that is a great strategy. But when um, you know that the two words are going to be similar, maybe the best thing to do is to look through the choices and make sure that the choices have similar words. If you have two words that are kind of opposite meanings, you know that's not going to be it. So if something was seamless, seamless, would it be a debacle? Remember, a debacle is a disaster, right? So what do you think, yes or no? If it is seamless, would it be a debacle? Everybody holler out, yes, no. 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 Seamless means it doesn't have any flaws whatsoever, right? There's not even a little bump. Um, and if it goes seamlessly, then that wouldn't be a disaster. It would be a good thing. So it can't be that scratch. Um, ungainly, hodgepodge. Are those similar words? Eh. Eh. No. Well, you know, if we're not sure, what we do is we leave it and we come back and we try plugging it in, right? So if you're not sure, you don't eliminate. You only eliminate if you know that's wrong. Okay. <clears throat> Unfortunate masterpiece. Give me a ding or an ant. Are those the same? No, that is correct. Thank you for the thumbs down. <laughs> okay, it was an inappropriate mix, but it was a success. Are those the same? <laughs> if it's inappropriate, it's not going to be successful. No, it's not going to be successful if it's inappropriate. Scratch it out. I'm not even going to make it good. Scratch. If it's harmonious, is that the, a failure? No. No. So we don't even need to plug the sentences in. You guys can eliminate the answers to using your brain. But when we plug it and we see that it was an ungainly mix of pace, comedy, pathos, and music and was correctly described as a hodgepodge. Um, Nick, what does it mean if something is ungainly? It has like large amounts of that, or over oversized amounts of stuff. Yeah, it doesn't balance out well, right? It's just unbalanced. Okay, very good. So it's an unbalanced mix. The mix doesn't go well together. Um, what is uh, Morgan? Do you know what a hodgepodge is? Yeah, it means like. When like there's like a disaster, um, or like a, or like something that like doesn't mix together. Very good. A hodgepodge is just a bunch of stuff thrown together that doesn't have anything to do with each other. Some things you mix together and they blend well, like peanut butter and chocolate. Okay, but some things you mix together and they go poorly, like sardines and chocolate. Okay, <laughs> so that would be a, a not a good mix. Very good. So it's definitely B. You guys did a great job on that. Mm -hmm. Even though I didn't do a good job on my smiley. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Stretch. Shake your hands. And we'll go to the last one. Last sentence. All right. Um, so that she would not be considered blank in her action, the department had made sure that the members of the advisory committee blank her plans before she started to implement them. Look them over. 
privately send me which one you think is the right answer or one that you have eliminated. If you eliminate it, tell me why you know it's wrong. Good, Nick. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Anne slash Emma. <laughs> I can't see. Is that you, uh, Emma? Okay. Yeah. It's a little dark, so I can, I see only your nose from about here. So. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, good explanation, Nick. Thank you. All right. Morgan, what do you think? All right, let's take a look. Um, so we know that whatever it is that she, she does not want to be considered whatever the first word is. So um, that she's doing something to, uh, to make sure that she doesn't appear that way. So the two words are kind of, the second one is going to uh, contradict the first one, right? It's going to say, because she did this, she can't be the first one. Um, let's take a look. Let's start by just plugging them in. You can't go wrong with just plugging in each one and seeing if it fits. So that she would not be considered capricious, remember just acting on uh, out of her head and doing whatever she comes to mind, so that she wouldn't be considered capricious in her actions. The department had made sure the members of the advisory committee ridiculed her plans before she started to implement them. Um, give me a thumbs up, thumbs down, or a ding, or an ant. Eh. Emma says, no, that's not it. Um, why? What does it mean to ridicule something, Emma? To belittle it. Yeah, it, yeah, very good. It comes from the Latin word that means to laugh, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> to laugh at something, right, to make fun of it. And so if she, so, you know, obviously she doesn't want the committee making fun of her plans. So, no, it's not that. Good guess, or good answer. All right. So that she would not be considered deliberative, remember thinking, knowing, and, and planning things out, doing it with weighing out all the consequences. Um, she made sure that the advisory committee ignored her plan. Uh, Morgan, does that sound good to you or not? Go, yes or no? Uh, I think no. Yeah, it's definitely not. Because if she wants, first of all, why would she not want to be considered deliberative? Somebody who's deliberative is someone who plans out well, who thinks about consequences, who weighs out all of the actions. That's the kind of thing you want to be known as. That's a positive trait. Um, and then having the committee ignore it doesn't make sense. Okay. Um, to be, so she wouldn't be considered impulsive. She had the advisory committee approve her actions. What do you think, Nick? I say yes. You say yes. Why? Um, Nick had actually sent me a sentence um, to explain his answer. So, Nick, why don't you read me what read everybody what that says so that they'll understand why you think that's the answer? Uh, you want me to read it? Or? Yes, you can read it. All right, so that she doesn't just do with whatever she wants. They approve her actions prior. Yeah, very good. So uh, impulsive and capricious have similar meanings, it means to act kind of without thinking just off the top of your head. So those two words are similar, but she doesn't want to be seen as impulsive, so she makes sure that they approve it. That's a possibility, but remember, just because it looks like it might be right doesn't mean that you stop and fill in the circle. You make sure the other answers aren't better because we are looking for the best fit. Um, so that she wouldn't be considered tardy in her actions, she made sure they designed her plans. That doesn't even make sense. Morgan, what does it mean to be tardy? Like late? Yeah, it comes from the Latin verb tardo, which means to slow down or to, uh, uh, to uh, what's the word, impede something. 
But no, she doesn't want to be late in her action, so she has the advisory committee plan everything out. No, that's wrong. All right. Um, so she wouldn't be considered provocative, in other words, trying to start something with her actions. She made sure they mislaid her plans before she started to implement them. Um, I don't even know what that means. Why would she want the people to lose the plans? Um, <laughs> That doesn't make sense. So, no, we can't be that. But it is definitely C. You guys did a good job on figuring that one out as well. So, good job. Smiley face. All right. Excellent. So, today we learned some really important words and some words that you might, that are commonly used on the SAT. Um, the words in particular that I want you guys to focus on are um, caprice or capricia, which means to uh, act kind of on the top, off the top of your head without any prior planning, which is the exact opposite of deliberate, which is to act with planning and weighing everything out. So capricious and deliberate are going to be antonyms, right? So those two words I want you guys to think about. And I also want you guys to think about to provoke or to be provocative, which is to try to... Uh, call somebody out or to start trouble. Excellent work. Um, debacle is a word that you that um, debacle is a word that I cannot even remember where I was going with that. Don't you hate when that happens? You start a sentence and you lose it. Of course, you're too young to have that happen to you. But it will. No, that it happens will. All the time. It will happen to you as you get older, because it even starts in your 20s that your hmm, the brain, your your cognitive functions <laughs> change as you get older, right? And your memory starts to play tricks on you and stuff like that. So be aware <laughs> of your yeah. <laughs> Because the chemicals in your brain aren't in equilibrium anymore, like they are when you're fresh and young. Right? Your brain gets old and kind of hard and crusty, yeah, because you're not in equilibrium. Very good. Mm -hmm. It's just harder to locate what you need to say. Oh, that's good, good, good. You guys are great. Um, all right, I was actually hoping to try to, to, because it was a holiday, to finish up a little bit early and give you guys a few, uh, few minutes uh, extra time, but I didn't make it. But um, you guys did a great job today. I really do want you to, to be thinking about decapitation and Mike the Wonder Chicken. Um, this week, and we'll talk some more about that. Um, the next class we'll have Wednesday at 7.30, and hopefully everyone will be there. And I hope that we will make, that we will tell everyone else who didn't make it today, you guys were the loyal ones who came on a holiday weekend, and just tell them how they missed the ultimate story of Mike the Wonder. <laughs> yeah, and please tell everyone you know, this is my favorite story. All right. Thanks so much, guys. I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Awesome job. Great Thank job, you. guys. Bye. Have a wonderful, have a wonderful holiday. Bye bye. Morgan, beautiful work, Nick.